good day. My name is Marie Muldowney. I'm the Managing Director at CSI. It's a Moody's analytics company. Thank you for joining our webinar, which was designed to focus on putting clients first. So clients entrust their money to our financial institutions and ensuring that their interests are front and center is the topic of today's webinar. So before we begin, just a few little items. Today's webinar is being recorded. If anyone gives you any ratings, financial reporting analysis, projections, or other observations as part of this webinar, these uh, pieces of information must be construed solely as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. And lastly, <clears throat> no one has permission to quote any of the comments made or the questions asked by the webinar audience. All the members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand side of your screen. So putting clients first is a core value of our advisors and planners. It's enshrined in our financial institutions codes of ethics and in the codes of conduct for our designation holders. It is really front and center. It is so important for clients to feel that they can put their trust in their financial institutions. Today's session will be moderated by Marshall Bayer. He's Senior Director of Product Strategy uh, here at CSI, and I will turn the session over to Marshall. Uh, thank you, Marie. Um, boy, when I started in the business uh, some almost 40 years ago now, things were very different. It was a very different business. Uh, for example, Know Your Client, believe it or not, was as much about protecting the firm uh, as it was about protecting clients. Um, advisors were known as stockbrokers. I believe the vast majority of, of those stockbrokers uh, were looking out for the best interests of their clients, but the business was a transaction and commission-based business, which did create lots of potential for conflicts. Over the past uh, many years now, there have been uh, regulatory initiatives that have strengthened inv investor protection and shaped the client advisor relationship. As some of you may remember the fair dealing model, the customer relationship model, and then more recently, client-focused reform initiatives. And th those are examples of, of, of regulatory initiatives with respect to investor protection. The business has changed as well, moving more and more towards a fee-based advice business where advisors and clients view money and investments as not necessarily ends in themselves, but means to ends, which are based on life goals, needs, and aspirations. Client discovery, as such has become a critical component of the investment management process. We are extremely fortunate to have four experienced investment advisors with us on this webinar to discuss how their approach to client relationships has evolved and what they are doing to understand their clients better and always put their clients' interests first. We have Sudha Sankar, a wealth advisor um, at, with uh, RBC Dominion Securities, a high ping Fu, an associate wealth and investment advisor also with RBC Dominion Securities. We have Darren Deering, who is a wealth advisor at Scotia Wealth Management, and Jim Templeton, who is a financial advisor at Manulife Securities, incorporated and a portfolio manager at Simplify Wealth. So we've got a great uh, panel here, and I believe Suda is going to start us uh, off with her presentation. I'll turn it over to you, Suda. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Marshall, for the warm introduction. And uh, I want to thank uh, the Canadian Securities Institute and all the participants here for this opportunity to present at the advisor roundtable on the topic of putting clients first. I would like to begin by acknowledging the fact that Marshall alluded to that we are seeing a big shift in the financial services industry from a transactional model to an advice-based relationship model. And it is even more pronounced in the wealth management practice where taking care of clients' holistic financial planning needs is at the core of what we do. So today I wanna to focus on, uh, I wanna share four areas of focus in my practice that allows us to put our clients at the front and center of everything that we do. The first one is shifting to advice-based client relationships. Again, um, you know, I'm repeating myself here, but 
again, going back to the fact that uh, the industry is moving to an advice-based relationship uh, model and a lot of advisory practices are already offering it or in the process of transitioning to it. Having said that, there is a notion among the general public that advisors don't necessarily have their best interest at heart or that we have a sales focused culture. And this can be a barrier for us as advisors because um, we also need the clients or potential clients buy in to this model if we were to be successful and give the right advice for our clients. We need to have a shift in the client mindset from seeing us as not as order takers, but as partners in your financial wellness journey. So when our clients or potential clients, you know, challenge me on this perspective, I always acknowledge them and I take a step back and have an open conversation with them uh, to understand where that opinion comes from. Sometimes it is uh, based on their previous experience, but most of the times it's often a misconception from something they heard or uh, read on the media or from their network. So when I know the story behind uh, their opinion, then it allows me to showcase uh, how we do, how we offer a differentiated wealth management experience at our firm. I explained to the clients that they not only get to work with me as an advisor, but they're also supported by a team of other wealth management experts, such as estate consultants, trust advisors, financial planning specialists, that can bring the expertise to them as and when needed and add value for them. Also being very transparent about our processes and services and related costs upfront helps to establish the trust and set the right client expectations. And secondly, I also consciously make an effort every time to set aside biases and assumptions in each client interaction. I'm of the mindset that working at, as an advisor for our clients is a privilege. So I approach it with a sense of respect and humility. And I'm very mindful that every client has a unique circumstance and experience that shapes their values, their lifestyle and their goals. And I'm inherently curious to learn about each one of them. And it also is an enriching experience for me because I also learn about different cultures, career and lifestyle choices from each one of them that expands my knowledge. And uh, as advisors, uh, we have a responsibility when we provide guidance to our clients to make sure that they don't fall into any behavioral traps that will prevent them from achieving their goals. And I would say that applies to us as well as advisors to not fall into the same uh, behavioral biases or assumptions in our client interactions. And how do I go about uh, being mindful of that? It is by embracing active listening. Um, I remember reading this quote in uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that says, uh, most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. And I think as advisors, we fall into that trap more often than we would like to, because you know, at the core of it, we are all knowledge experts and we pride in, in our expertise and knowledge, and we have this enthusiasm to help clients. And so we are sometimes uh, quick to offer them solutions without understanding the full story. So expertise and knowledge is certainly the cornerstone of uh, successful advice. However, if we can pair it with empathy, then that becomes a winning combination. For example, if a client were to say us, one of their goals was to take care of their parents, we can pause there and take a step back and ask questions to understand what that actually means to them. Does it mean that you know, they, are, you know, they, they have to spend time with their parents? Does it mean that they are financially responsible for them? Or are they acting as powers of attorney for their parents? And knowing the answer to those questions will then allow us to 
give the right strategies and solutions for our clients. And when we embrace this type of active listening, clients are also, you know, um, they also have, have been, are invested in the process. Uh, they understand the solutions that we recommend and they're more likely to follow through with them. So all these, uh, you know, being mindful of all these behavioral nuances naturally leads us to conduct meaningful discovery conversations. And uh, having those discovery conversations then allows us to have a strong advice-based relationship that can continue for years and possibly, you know, work with uh, several generations. And uh, apart from these behavioral uh, practices, there are also certain other processes that we incorporate to have objective discovery meetings. One of them is we sent out an agenda to our clients before every meeting that lists the topics of discussion, where the meeting is to be held, uh, the time allocated for the meeting, and who will be attending the meeting because all meetings are not between <clears throat> myself and the client all the time. Uh, we could bring in a wealth management partner uh, we could bring in a banking partner, and sometimes we have joint meetings with clients, other advisors, such as an accountant or a lawyer, and sometimes even clients bring their own children to the meeting just because they want to know uh, where they stand with your financial life. So the main criteria is it's based on client preferences and what is being discussed at the meeting. And once the meeting is completed, we also take the time to reflect and retain this information in client records so that it allows us to have that seamless, allows us to provide seamless service and advice uh, to our clients going forward. Uh, we also then sent out a meeting summary to the clients, uh, you know, summarizing what was discussed, the next steps, and also potentially book the next meeting. And when we do these processes consistently, it becomes a standard and that's something very easy for us to follow through and for clients to understand. And it also allows the clients to articulate this experience to their friends and family uh, and giving us referrals. So that's, uh, that's how we strive to provide a differentiated wealth management experience here with our team. Now I will turn it back to Marshall. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sudha. That was great. Um, very uh, informational and uh, has generated some questions, I see. So we'll, but we'll wait till the end. Uh, um, so I'm going to turn things over to Haiping Fu and um, take it away. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall and Maria, for the uh, introduction. And thanks to CSI for this wonderful opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to share some of my experience with you. Um, first of all, I really appreciate my colleague Suda's insight and what she has just shared. Um, adding to some of her points here, we have certainly been seeing a lot of changes in our industry. Um, in the past, some clients may be concerned about an advisor who seems more focused on making sales and closing deals rather than prioritizing their best interest. However, um, as the investment industry evolved over the past decade, as we all see here, um, so has the role of investment advisor. Investment advisor is no longer viewed as a stock trader. Instead, it has transformed into a wealth advisor role to their client. My role extends beyond recommending stock or bond. It is a holistic wealth management approach that I provided to my client, from offering service on tax planning and legal matters to insurance and trust planning. Um, my primary goal is not about product sales, but is to serve as the comprehensive wealth advisor for my client and for every aspect and stage of their lives. And I think that um, my client really appreciate this approach where I take time to truly understand them and their family, um, their retirement dreams, or even their wishes that they hold for their future generation. So it is a long lasting partnership between me and my client. As I help them grow their family wealth, I'm also growing my business 
And so we are on the same page in pursuit of a common goal. And clients come to view me as a trust advisor throughout these journeys together. Um, let's talk a little bit about trust here and how clients believe that we put their interests first. Um, my client often reach out to me, discuss like their children's education, uh, university choices, and they sometimes seek guidance when deciding where to live when their children go off to college. And sometimes just give me a call, randomly chat about their upcoming family holiday or small things that happen in their life. While all these conversations seem to be very small and informal, but they sometimes can lead to a more meaningful financial discussion, such as um, retirement planning and wealth transfer for their children. So I think that trust is nurtured through all these ongoing and small dialogues, and there's a value being created to my client through all this advice that I provide to them. And they felt that I, I thoroughly understand their needs. And so trust is really not something that um, you can establish overnight. It's a continuous process. It requires maintaining the consistent action and behavior um, that reflect who I am and how I value my client and how I implement my investment philosophy and process. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, um, I have clients who reach out to me a few years after listening to uh, one of my online seminars. It seems like that was the first time they reach out. However, they have paid very close attention to what I have shared on my website, in public events, and even just at some community gatherings over the years. Uh, through this consistent behaviors that from their observation, they have already, de already developed a sense of knowing and trusting me, even though we have only just met in person. So I believe that the brand that you cultivated reflects not only your identity as a investment advisor, but also as who you are as a person. And once the client trusts you are the individual they want to work with, they will trust you putting their interests first. Um, and speaking about making your clients feel comfortable on sharing and not worry about being judged, um, in my experience, um, from the very beginning, my approach as a wealth advisor is to let my client know that the more I understand about their lives, the better I can utilize my knowledge to assist them in achieving their goal. And they will feel comfortable sharing with me, knowing that I'm not here to pass judgment, but to really providing help and support to them. Um, so a very important aspect is um, it's really understanding my client's culture. We are, uh, we are in a diverse environment. Clients can be from anywhere in the world with very unique background. I specialize in serving immigrants, especially new immigrants. And being an immigrant myself, I understand the challenges of putting yourself in a new system and a new environment where language and culture are so different. And I know, or we all know that money means different things to different people. I listen carefully to what they say and trying to understand their background, experience, and what shape their value, and sometimes relating their story to mine. And from there, I can then leverage my knowledge and experience to assist them. Um, I understanding their needs and goals, I often will collaborate with specialists from various fields, like my colleagues who I just mentioned. In IBC Domain Security, we have a team of wealth management specialists, including accountants, estate planning lawyers, trust advisor, and insurance specialists. Together, I can offer them comprehensive support to really help them protecting and also grow their family wealth. Um, and a lot of time, I don't just tell them what they should do or not, but instead I would use uh, financial planning too to demonstrate and present a number to guide them to consider their options, whether their lifestyles and family value aligned with their financial goals. 
So I, I truly believe understanding your client's culture, it's very crucial. And also keep maintaining an inclusive and diverse mindset. It's very important too. And it is a cornerstone of my practice. Um, when it comes to how I communicate with my client, I find that um, there's a lot and so much to share within our industry from a, a professional standpoint. However, I also understand that not everyone share the same level of passion for learning or discussing these topics as I do. So I have learned to reserve this discussion for the future and choosing not to dive into them during our initial meetings. Instead, I would focus on understanding their, their lives and their needs. This approach really, really allows me to tailor my assistance to their specific requirements. Um, and how I do this is that uh, I often would use open-ended questions to encourage them to talk. Um, I use this question to uncover their family dynamic and to understand what's most important to them. Um, and after gaining a deeper understanding of their needs, I can then assess their investment knowledge and then communicate with them in a language that they can understand. Um, for example, I sometimes would share portfolio example to make sure that we are on the same page. Uh, sometimes I would relay uh, some story that resonates with them. Um, lastly, I'm going to touch base on a little bit of uh, initial meeting style to new or potential clients. My approach varies depends on the client's preference and needs. Some of my older clients prefer face-to-face -face communication, while others are more uh, inclined towards online interaction, especially during pandemic. Um, with certain clients, especially those uh, uh, more reserved, they prefer to listen first. In, in those cases, I would begin with a presentation, introducing myself and my team, uh, detailing how uh, my investment process is and explaining how I can assist them. Um, following that, I would ask a series of questions to really better understand their unique situation. Um, on the other hand, if some clients are more direct and wish to express themselves right away, in those cases, I would just skip the introduction uh, introduction and immediately just dive into their needs and goals. So my approach is really, really tailored based on their initial sharing. And during this initial and discovery meeting, I just uh, maintained a very flexible structure. Um, however, I was, as I move on to, to the implementation phases, I would utilize tools like PowerPoint or um, financial planning tools or structure agenda to try to maintain a more organized and focused discussion. And I find that this would help clients know uh, what to expect as we move forward. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and um, I'll, I'll pass back to Marshall. Thanks for having me. OK, thank you very much. That was great. Um, and we're going to move on to Darren. Darren uh, Deering, who's a wealth advisor at Scotia uh, Wealth Management. Uh, Darren, take it over. Great. Um, great. Thanks, Marshall. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I love to hear my opinion. Um, I, uh, I've been in this industry for 10 years now. I own my own company and thing at the time, but I was looking for something in one of those industries. I was hoping to make a difference in. in uh, Dar Darren, excuse me, Ms. Marshall, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, I don't know what the issue is, yeah, but um, maybe you can speak up. Audio. Is that better if I hold my phone? Yeah, that's a bit better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I was saying, yeah, I've, I've been in this business 10 years. Um, I have enjoyed investing and learning about the markets, uh, how they, you know, trying to figure out how they work. Uh, but I haven't really thought about using that knowledge to help people. Um, once I had that intention, though, the opportunity to become a, an advisor popped up out of nowhere. My One of my very first prospects was a, a widow whose husband had just passed away a month before we met. He had looked after all the finances and investments, and she was lost. Um, I realized 
very quickly, she wasn't looking for a conversation around alpha or standard deviation. She was looking for someone who uh, she could trust. She needed someone to tell her that she was going to be okay. Um, so I decided I wasn't just going to tell her, I was going to show her. I was going to spend as much time as I needed to ensure that I proved to her that she was not going to run out of money, to prove to her that she could live the life that she wanted, that her husband wanted for her, and that they had worked so hard for her to have. But when I said that to her, of course, she cried, and, and then I cried, and uh, I, I could see and, and feel her release some of that stress. So it was in that first meeting I realized the power of this role. I realized that my job was to advise and to educate. And to this day, I, I say that in, in every first meeting. So I think I, I would, you know, whenever I'm speaking with a younger advisor, a new advisor, I would ask, you know, what's your motivation? Why are you in this business? Perhaps like me, you realize the power of being able to help. Uh, it's an incredibly rewarding career. Uh, perhaps also like me, you love giving your opinion. Uh, my wife says this is my favorite part of the job. She, she might be right. Um, maybe you're looking to secure your future. Maybe you're fascinated by the markets and want to learn how they work. But regardless of your motivation, I'd, su I'd suggest you can only achieve your goals by putting your clients first. And when your actions match your motivations, this is a pretty simple yet powerful role. So like my colleagues, um, I, I, I mentioned trust earlier. Uh, my clients trust me. They trust that any advice I give is in their best interest, not mine, and certainly not my firm. Um, I met with a prospect recently who said they think that their advisor's only goal is to make money for himself and not them. And whether or not that's true, the client's perception is that their interests don't come first, and it's that perception that will be the end of that relationship. So how do you build trust? Well, trust, uh, I think, is earned. It's earned by being brutally honest and transparent. That same prospect that I mentioned uh, told me about a loss they had of about $200,000. They weren't comfortable with the risk they had and thought they were invested conservatively. They're 76 years old, and they asked me if they moved their investments to me, would I be able to recover the $200,000? So without hesitation, I said no that given their age and the conservative risk tolerance they now have, I don't think it's possible or even in their best interest to try and recover that loss. They were pretty surprised by that answer. And then they told me that they had moved their investments to their current advisor six months ago because he said he could recover that loss. And in fact, now they are down another $30,000. So telling people what they want to hear is not our job. It's not how you build trust and certainly not how you build a lasting relationship. Um, being transparent is another way of building trust. Most people we meet will be at a disadvantage given that we are experts and they are not. We have the CSI courses and the designations that our clients do not. We worked hard to build our knowledge base and to be considered experts. And that discrepancy in knowledge comes with a responsibility to ensure you put your client's interests first. So for instance, in every first meeting with a prospect, I tell them how I get paid and how our fees in, in this industry work. I bring it up before they do. I know it's a question that some folks are hesitant to ask. And I have learned over the years that it's a topic that most people don't understand. I show them percentages. I show them numbers as examples. So I think it's one thing to say your fee is 1%. It's a whole other conversation when you say to someone that they'll be paying $10,000 a year. So being transparent with fees um, shows your prospects that are you, go you are going to be upfront and transparent about everything. It's a simple way of showing them that your goal is to educate them on how this relationship works. So we're talking today about putting your clients first. I'd suggest you show that to your clients by building trust. Clients believe that you are putting them first when they trust you. I'd also suggest that whatever your motivation is for being in this industry, that goal can only be solved when you put your clients first. I thought I'd provide you with an example of the value of putting your clients first by discussing a, a marketing campaign. So I, I, I recently decided to target a specialized group of potential clients. 
I joined their association. I put an ad in their newsletter. I sponsored their golf tournament, and I even held a seminar for their members that included a lovely lunch here in town. Total cost so far is probably around $5,000, but that doesn't include my time or my team's time. If I factor in the hours that went into that preparation for the ad, uh, the time golfing, which I'm not complaining about, uh, the prep for the seminar, the emails, the phone calls, the letters to members, I'd suggest we have another $10,000 in this campaign. So a conservative guess is that this campaign has cost approximately $15,000 and about 40 hours. So why do it? Well, of course, the hope is that you will see a return on that investment. So far, I have one client from that campaign. I have several prospects that I hope will turn into clients, but that will take more time and more effort. This client that I have now has close to a million dollars in investable assets. So let's say their holdings are in fee-based accounts, and that will generate 1% or $10,000 a year in revenue or, or management fees. And let's say that we're paid on a grid of 50%, and so our revenue is $5,000 per year before tax. So ignoring income tax, which of course is, is quite significant uh, here in Canada, uh, especially in New Brunswick, uh, it'll take at least three years before we break even on that investment. Now, of course, that duration will change if we sign more clients, but my point is that it can take a significant investment of money and time to acquire new clients and realize a return. So if you contrast that uh, from, with, a, with a referral from a happy client, most, uh, my most recent referral came from a client I've had for just about over seven years. Uh, she asked me if I could speak with her sister that moved to New Brunswick from Ontario. We met for an hour and by the end of that meeting, she was a client. So what did that acquisition of a new client cost compared to the new client from that targeting market campaign? So obviously there's no comparison. I of course put time and effort into building that existing relationship, um, but I was doing that anyway. So the referral from my existing client came after years of building trust years of making sure that it, I did what I said I was going to do, making sure that I heard what my client uh, needs and, and wants, and making sure that she understands that I put her interest first by being honest and transparent. She didn't tell her sister about me because of the returns she's getting. We all know what the markets have been doing lately. Um, she told her sister that she could trust me and my advice. My client knew that I would be honest and transparent with her sister. She knew that if there was value in us working together, I'd tell her sister that. And if there wasn't any value, I'd tell her that as well. So that trust, of course, took time to develop, but it started in our first meeting when I told her that I would prove to her that she would be okay. So putting your clients first is, of course, um, ethical, moral, and I'd suggest an absolute must in this business but it's also efficient and cost effective. Being honest and transparent not only will help you land a prospect and build that relationship, but it will help you build your business by creating a cost effective referral system. You will have clients telling their family and their friends about you. They will tell them that they can trust you. And from my experience, those referrals are easier to close and exceptionally rewarding. So thank you, folks. Sorry about the audio. It's probably a maritime thing, but uh, back to you, Marco, and uh, <laughs> thanks again. No, thanks, Darren, though. You were clear as a bell uh, in your voice and in your message, so thank you. That was great. And um, we're going to turn it over to Jim Templeton, who's a financial advisor at Manulife Securities and a portfolio manager at Simplify Wealth. So, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Darren. If it proves to be a maritime thing, I hope it doesn't extend to Newfoundland, but we'll give this a shot and I'm sure Marshall will dive in if he needs to. Um, I want to say thanks very much to the CSI. I want to thank, say thank you very much to my colleagues so far. The great joy of going last is that I've written down a whole bunch of things here in the last half hour, and, and I'm thrilled to, to, to have been able to do that. Um, I did think that a good starting point for starting to think through and talk about client centricity and putting clients first would be perhaps to ask the clients 
Um, <clears throat> and I was reminded about something that we did from about 2002 to about 2008, which now I think has sort of taken on the moniker of the client board of directors. Um, and, and, and really what that was was an opportunity for us to sit with some people as a group and, and really get some feedback on some things like, like messaging and the service models and, and scheduling and the like. Um, that proved to be very helpful to us. And, and now, you know, 20 plus years later, it, it still is sort of the template and the framework. So, so we, we were able to build a service model based on the feedback we got and, and ongoing feedback. I think that might be a little harder to do now. I don't know, therefore, that it's brilliant advice. Because um, I, I think some of the feedback, unfortunately, that you might get on servicing, you might not be able to do uh, for all sorts of regulatory reasons. But but at the same time, it was very, very helpful to us. Um, it's a bit of a silly story, but but the way that I would position that as in conversation was was I had a, I had a, a situation which happily hasn't proven to come to, to fruition so far. But what I would say was if I was hit by a bus and I was sitting on a cloud next to Jimi Hendrix learning how to play Stairway to Heaven on a harp, how would I want my grandmother, my mother, and my wife to be treated if I wasn't there to run the service model? And and it was a bit late and and, and that was helpful that way, but it certainly helped stimulate the conversation of what were the kinds of things that people would be looking for in that scenario. So if there's a point to that at all, then what I would encourage everyone who's listening is just be authentic. Um, find your voice, learn to tell your story well. Uh, very early in my career, uh, I had the good fortune of being surrounded by a couple of marketing gurus with a bunch of other fellow rookies and, and just talking about business development and how to be an advisor and those kinds of things. And you know, they, they were getting some pushback from some of the other rookies. And, and one of them, in a you know, minor fit of exasperation, finally looked at one of them and said, look, you can be a lamppost in this business, provided you can surround yourself with other lampposts. And, and, you know, let's agree that regardless of your form of lamppost, you're always going to do your best work for the people with whom you have the best relationship. And, and the relationship, of course, being the two-way street. So, so, you know, it, it might not always be easy, but those are the clients that'll energize you. Those are the people that, you know, you'll really want to look after. And, and, you know, sort of, again, find your own lampposts and surround yourself if you can with your lampposts, because it just makes it easier to want to do good work for them. The other thing I'd say on this topic is, is I'm the father of three young adult boys. And I don't know if anybody, any other parents have this experience, but they don't listen to me a whole lot. One of the things, though, I know that they have taken away is a sentence that I like to throw at them, which is, if you always tell the truth, you never need to remember what you said. I don't remember who I stole that from. I'd happily give them credit if I did. But I do know that it's the one thing that, that has resonated with them. And I think it's incredibly valuable to do that in client relationships as well. I think it speaks to, to, to Darren's point as well about just being brutally honest. Um, you know, just, just tell people the truth. If you tell them the truth, you can deal with that, and you'll remember what you said. There's a great line on, on this concept as well of, of, of client return or sort of client focus, um, and, and it comes from Ellen Besner. If you're not familiar with Ellen Besner's work, I would highly encourage you to become familiar with it. I would say that, that, that Ellen Besner has probably forgotten more about zero rules than I'll ever know. Um, but, but as we started down this path specific on client focus reforms a few years ago, I participated in a webinar and, and Ms. Besner's comment, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, so I apologize, but basically what it said was, you'll need to have engaged clients. And, and again, I go, you know, I go back to my silly lamppost, but, but it is true. Uh, I think that's critical and, and it has become a bit of our fit process when we're talking to clients, we're just trying to share with them who we are, what we do what we're good at, what we know we're not. Um, and and I, I think that's valuable for, for, for both sides, right? Again, I go back to my comments, that you'll always do your best work for the people um, with whom, you, you know, they energize you. So, so if you can find those people up front, then I think it's a great idea. And again, you, you can help them understand the client engagement is gonna be really, really important. Um, in terms of, of, of helping clients feel heard, I, I think I can give you two somewhat uh, uh, sort of uh, actionable ways you can do that. What, one that we do, you know, particularly in here, and, and, and in here, you know, it, it's gonna sound really simple, but, you know, answer the phone and don't have voicemail. 
Um, it, 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 again, that, that might be silly, but one of the phrases we love to use around here is, is if you dial 754-1975 between the hours of 9 and 5.30, Newfoundland time, um, a human being will answer. And, and I think that's a great way to help with trust and accountability. Um, you know, I have a team that they're, they're all licensed and, and they all have the autonomy to act on the client's behalf. Um, usually when a client is phoning, they're really just looking to get something done. They're just looking to cross something off their to-do list. They don't need my royal assent in order to do that. Um, so, so we have a team that, that is able to action these things for clients just to get it off their list. It also provides them with an opportunity to have great conversations with clients. Um, and, and that just helps us in the long run as well. So, so, you know, we're, we're accountable, but we're also easy to get a hold of. And, and I think that's very, very valuable. Um, nobody likes being on hold. Nobody likes playing telephone. Um, though sometimes our industry sort of requires it. The other thing I'd say is, is this is a bit more at a portfolio level. Um, and, and I'm not the big, and so we're discretionary here in this office. I'm not the biggest fan of models, but that's a totally different webinar for a totally different day. Um, but, but I do believe in some concepts like mass customization, but even though we're discretionary, if a client reaches out and says, Jim, do I have to own ABC security? Um, the answer is no, no, absolutely not. You don't, but, but, but in my saying, no, you don't need to own it. You, you do need to tell me why we won't own it. Um, because I want to know the story about why that is causing you some level of pain. And, and sometimes it's, it's, you know, what we might categorize as, as socially responsible or, or something like that. But, but sometimes it's just an organization that, that just leaves them a bad taste. And, and so, so I think that's a great way to sort of add a little bit of value there. It absolutely helps you get to know your client a little bit better. Um, but it's also good in, from the perspective of, of, of letting them feel heard, um, cause we'll action that for them right away. And, and hopefully we won't do anything soon. There, there was a discussion previously about uh, open-ended questions. I know I think mentioned it, and I, you know, a huge fan. And and it brings me to to perhaps again, this might be a little bit more for a newer advisor, um, and and a discussion around sort of demonstrating, um, you know, what they know and how to best sort of prove what you know. And and again, I go back to my authenticity. But but what I would suggest is. Um, you, you, you probably prove what you know more by the quality and timing of the questions that you ask um, than your, you know, Wikipedia-like knowledge of facts and figures and MERs and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, when I'm taking my dog for a walk in the woods, happily there's no cameras around, but, but you know, usually what I'm doing is, is, is thinking through what's a good question to ask. Um, and then in my own head, I try and figure out perhaps what the, potential responses to that might be. So I, I might have a couple of thoughts in my head. Um, but, but you know, be careful, like, you know, have your questions ready. Don't interrogate anybody. Don't be creepy. Um, a great way to frighten some people away. Um, but, but I, you know, the, the more you can get someone else to talk, honestly, the more you'll learn and, and probably the smarter you look. Um, and then when it comes to things like the facts and the figures, let's face it, you know, people have access to a lot of that information anyway. Um, there's a great Seth Godin line, which is anything worth knowing is worth looking up. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to tell your high school kids that because they're quick to say that to their teachers and that may or may not go well. Um, but, but if I was going to encourage you to work on anything, it, you, it wouldn't be, you know, proving what you know, it would be proving that you know what to ask. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is, is, um, in, in this, I go back to my, my girl guides, boy scouts, one-on-one. Um, when I was growing up, my mother was the provincial commissioner of the Girl Guides, while my father was provincial commissioner of the Boy Scouts concurrently. So go figure that had an influence on my life. But but it's the basic be prepared. Um, you know, the mentor of mine said to me years ago, you won't always be the smartest person in the room, but there's no reason you can't be the best prepared. Um, I do think it helps with your confidence. But, but the other thing I think it helps with is it gives you the opportunity to really listen. Um, you know, uh, uh, at the very beginning, there was a pseudo made a wonderful comment about, uh, you know, be, being prepared, just listening as opposed to, you know, preparing yourself to speak next. And I think there's tremendous value in that. 
Um, and, and if you're really listening for the important information, and I'm going to say this, and not just the KYC details, right? Not just that stuff. I, I do think in this business, and when we're thinking about client centricity, we think a lot about client centricity as opposed, versus a product that we might sell. Um, but I think there's also an element of this client centricity versus the KYC data that we know we have to gather. Like you'll get to that, You're, you'll get to your forms. Um, but I think it's really valuable to be prepared to listen and, and get the stuff that isn't potentially a material fact. It's probably really, really important, and but it may not be a material fact. So so I think if you're prepared for those scenarios, it, it just makes for a smoother ride. So that's really it for me. Thanks very much for the opportunity and thanks to everybody for listening so far. And, and Marshall, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Jim. That's great. And I love the Jimi Hendrix uh, reference. Um, so I guess um, before we go into questions, I guess the common theme is is really um, you know putting your clients' interests first is is certainly not just a matter of ticking a regulatory box, but really is essential to the um, to your practice and the success of your practice, and and building trust um, is is so key and and it, you know among many other things it encourages a client to open up to you and. And provide the type of information that you need in order to give um, advice. And, and the better the information you get from the client, the better, you know, and, and more targeted the advice can be. So, um, very critical part of your your practice. And as I mentioned, it's not just a matter of meeting a regulatory obligation. Um, so, all uh, we've got some questions here. So maybe I'll turn to the uh, questions. Um, one question we have here is uh, when it comes to sharing uh, uh, individual financial data, um, this is from the client's perspective, you, usually the client hesitates and will not have an open conversation. How can we build the trust in the very first meeting um, um, in order to sort of encourage um, you know, openness with the client and the client to has less reservations about providing the information that that you need really to to to, to provide uh, high quality advice. So I'll just open it up to any of the panelists to uh, to respond. Can you hear me okay, Marshall? Yep, yep. I I switched to earbuds. I I think that's going to be better. Okay, so. great. Um, I, first thing I always think of is I I think it's important that they understand that. You know, you're human, that your job is to try and help them. And in order to do that, there's certain information that they have to give you. Um, but I think it helps when you relate um, different stories about your life and, you know, sort of humanize you a little bit that, you know, look, I've, I've got a family, I've got kids, I've done this, I've done that. And it can't be all about you, of course, but at the same time, you need to be relatable. They need to understand why you're asking those questions. You know, and I don't think there's any harm in specifically coming out and saying, this is what my expectation is. This is a relationship. I, I'm going to be making contributions. I need you to make contributions. And for some people that aren't willing to do that, then maybe it's just not a good fit. Great, any other, uh, any other uh, responses? Um, I just would like to add that, um, you know, I mean, I would I would agree to what Darren said, that it's all about building a rapport. And one way of doing that is, um, you know, sharing uh, your own stories and also examples from uh, uh, other client experiences uh, with this uh, new or prospective client. And a lot of times I use the analogy of how I am the doctor for their financial health like how they have a doctor for their health and how it's best to 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 tell me everything that I could uh, that they could possibly can so that I can give them the right advice and recommendations and I also try to explain to them um, how you know withholding any sort of information uh, that is material to the advice I give could result in me giving them the right sort of recommendations right uh, so Again, when we, when when there's a, a rapport already built, when they see that uh, we are uh, we are very uh, you know we, we are looking after their best interest, and then when we try to 
help them understand objectively what it means to give us all the information we need, then uh, it becomes an easy process going forward. Okay, great. Um, a question, um, Sudha, I think you had mentioned um, the importance of identifying sort of behavioral biases in your, your clients. And uh, um, just taking that a step further, um, and I think the term used in that field is nudging. How do you, when, when you recognize maybe a bias that is uh, a bit self-defeating, um, how do you sort of nudge clients uh, back towards a, a kind of a better place to, so that they're in a position to make better, you know, better decisions? Well, um, yeah, I'm not a behavioral scientist and, you know, it's always I go in to every meeting, um, making sure that I go with an open mind. One of the first advice early in my early career, one of the early advice I received is check your ego at the door. And I'm always very, uh, you know, mindful of that. And I go into work every day with an open mind, regardless of where I might be in my personal headspace. Uh, and I understand that when people come into the meetings, um, life happens and they're coming in with uh, a lot of loaded assumptions or, uh, or incidents that have been happening uh, in their lives. Um, so when, when, I, when I recognize certain uh, behavioral biases or certain uh, traps that the clients may fall into, uh, I sometimes, um, you know, don't, um, uh, I, I sometimes stop there and then try to have those open discussions with them to understand uh, where, um, why they're assuming what they're assuming or why they're deciding what they're deciding. And sometimes if it's hard for us to articulate or to reach a decision at that moment, I always tell them, um, you know, we can put, put this aside for now and then maybe sleep over it, think about it, and then come back to make the decision, right? Not make that any decisions at that point of time when we don't necessarily have a clear uh, understanding of, uh, of what's the right thing to do. So I always don't um, necessarily push for a sale or, or don't necessarily put yeah. so push for solutions at every point of time, but wait for things to sink in and a time to reflect and then for them to even um, get to the place where they're comfortable making those decisions. And it That's doesn't great. have to necessarily be what, uh, what we initially discussed. It could be something totally different, but at least they have had the time to uh, reflect and you know, uh, reach that decision. Yeah. Right. No, thank you. Uh, any other responses? And may maybe in the context of today's market, a bit of a shaky market with inflation and maybe on the verge of recession and global affairs, a lot of nervous investors out there. How are you just generally addressing that? Um, you know, bias towards, um, you know, maybe a, a little bit of panic, uh, uh, you know, in, in the market and just how, how do you approach uh, your clients who are coming to you with, with that kind of concern about, about all those factors? Well, for, for me personally, I think our role is to protect our clients. Um, Sometimes it's to protect them from themselves. So right. being that sounding board that um, helps them understand that, you know, these, this, uh, the stuff that we're going through, we've seen it before, you know, the, mm -hmm. the tendency is to have an emotional reaction. Um, I think those are important things to understand. And for me and, and for my clients, when, when I believe that um, they need to be focused on longer term uh, solutions and conversations that it's easy for me to have that conversation because I truly believe that I've seen it. I have access to data that they don't have access to. I can see things that they can't potentially see. And I know that my role is to make sure that I protect them. And again, I say sometimes it's, it's to protect them from themselves. 
Marshall, if I can also just add to that, sure. and this is from, from the perspective of my practice in particular. So when when clients um, are you know tempted to make those hasty decisions, we always go back to the drawing board, pull out their financial plan that we have created for them, and then uh, revisit what the goals are, what were the strategies that we put in place, does it still make sense? If it does, then what is the need to make this change? right? Unless there has been some material changes to their personal or financial life. So having those uh, tools available and implementing those um, planning for the clients um, helps um, helps keep, uh, keep us on track. Great. Okay. Okay. We've got lots of questions. There are a number of questions, uh, I guess, from aspiring advisors on how uh, it's best to kind of get into the industry. Uh, fewer for a new, uh, newcomers to Canada who might have had some financial advisory experience uh, in another country. But any advice uh, for those people? We have three or four questions along that uh, that line. Um, I'll share some of my experience. Um, sure. I think that being a newcomer that I, I share because I'm I'm. A, um, I'm an immigrant as well, so I've been through all of this. So I think that it's really um, prepare yourself. Like um, when you're not sure if this is the right opportunity for you, but don't don't feel beat down. But keep keep your mind open, and then whatever you meet, and try to find out how to get there, and then what you need to be prepared to get there. And don't worry about starting low. Like uh, I starting from like a branch assistant, but I learn from everybody that who are senior from me, and then I just take my time to learn. And then when you keep preparing, keep learning and equip yourself when opportunity come you just try to go for it and that would be my advice for anyone who is new there and sometimes it may take time but if you don't give up and then you know what you want and then just keep keep doing what you're doing and the opportunity will come great thank you okay uh we have another question here uh what processes do you have in place to deliver a consistent experience to your full client base or do you rely on a team approach or various softwares to help deliver it? I, I mean, I can jump in on that one if you want. Sure. I mean, you know, we, we basically tried to build this place around the service model. And the nice thing about that is you can articulate to people what you think their expectation should be. Um, so, so whether or not, you know, you, you want to use some kind of software to, to help you on track with that, but, but we, we, we do have an internal system. I mean, you know, in some ways, kind of like the dentist's office, you know, you don't get out without having a half a vision of what the next one looks like. Um, but what's kind of nice about that as well is it, it, and going back to a question you asked previously, previously, it, it does cut down on the clients calling because they're nervous about something. Like if they know they have something coming up, if there's a, you know, the next phone call is coming. And again, I'm not suggesting you need to necessarily put it in the calendar. You know, are you going to be available in three and a half months? Because who the heck knows? But 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 the clients know that we know when we'll be reaching out next. So so I, I do think you can build a service matrix, help them understand exactly what it is. And and again, if it's a good fit for them, then then then, then it, it helps you manage the practice. Thanks, Jim. Um, trying to get to more questions here. Um, this one was uh, sorry, directed at uh, at Haiping, um, 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 Haiping said in her presentation that she goes to meet clients with financial experts in order to provide wholesome service to the clients and build trust. My question is, will involvement of these experts not be scary to the clients because of their fees, which will be ultimately borne by the clients? All right. Um... I mentioned we have a, a team of specialists, um, accountant, lawyer, or uh, trust advisor. All this is actually um, added value service to a client with no fee within our firm. So I, I would tell my clients that uh, if they're my clients and then I would provide this service to them, there's no fee. But if this, when the time comes to this, um, um, this, um, uh, involvement of uh, external lawyer or accountant that they need to execute, I would 
mention to them that they may be fee involved, but I would be very uh, open with them that what need to be done and what does it look like. And then um, upon the agreement that I would make a suggestion to connect them with the external lawyer or accountant. But everything that we provided within our firm is actually my value, uh, my service to my client without uh, adding fees at all. Great, thank you. Your client, okay, maybe one more question. How do you safely retain your client relationship when introducing them with other experts who may also partner with other wealth advisors? Yeah, I, I, I would yeah. suggest that, you know, if you've built a good, strong relationship with your client, you don't need to worry about that stuff. Um, yeah. I think that... Sometimes, you know, you, you can't let that worry get in the way of what's best for your client. I have a, a tax accountant here in town that I use, and I know he refers to someone else, another wealth advisor, but he's the best tax accountant in town. So I'm confident in my relationship with my clients, and I need to get them in front of the best, and so we go to this guy. Thanks. Great response. Okay. I think it's one o'clock now, so uh, excellent conversation today. Um, and this concludes our event. Uh, thank you, Sudha, Haiping, Darren, and Jim for participating in this webinar and providing uh, practical insights. Um, if you have any additional questions, please email uh, designations at csi.ca. And uh, a replay of this event will be available in the coming days. And for more information on upcoming webinars, please visit our website at csi.ca. And once again, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you.